Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren, en de Bali is zo'n plek. Good evening. Yes. Um, let me check the sound, yes. Okay, we're good. This is Aktas Erdogan on guitar. So this one is for Zeynep, this one is for freedom, this one is for losing your country, for, you, for losing your home, for feeling displaced, and for finding a universal family who fight for freedom, and for liberty, and for love. And if you feel it, please clap your hands when you hear the beat. Also the man with the newspaper. أنا مغربية أنا جزائرية تربيت في الغربة دايما برانية توحشتك يا بلادي توحشتك وطني ما نسيتك شي أرضي أنا بنتك يا روحي أصلي بلادي تلفنا ونسينا وشرينا باش نبينو فلوسنا تلفنا وبكينا على بلادنا حبيتك وطني توحشتك وطني أنا دايما مغرابية حبيتك وطني توحشتك وطني أنا أنا دايما بنت بلادي دبا فات الزمان دبا فات الأيام ولينا نبين راسنا لاباس علينا ما نسينك شي بلادنا كل نهار كان بكيو ما كينا شي الراحة ولينا مكروهين أصلي بلادي تلفنا ونسينا وشرينا باش نبينو فلوسنا تلفنا وبكينا على بلادنا حبيتك وطني توحشتك وطني 
انا دايما مغربيه حبيتك وطني توحشتك وطني انا انا دايما بنت بلادي لا 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 حبيتك وطني توحشتك وطني انا دايما مغربيه حبيتك وطني توحشتك وطني انا انا دايما بنت بلادي لا 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 So that was Raja El Mohendis. She's a singer, a poet. Uh, she makes plays, she makes short movies. Um, and this won't be the last of uh, what you've seen of her because she's coming back later on to joining conversation and she will end this evening with a song. Uh, so good evening. Welcome everyone. I'm really glad that you're all here. Um, I'm sorry we started a bit late, but as uh, uh, the chief of the NCTV just said it, we are very emotional people uh, and we wanted to double check everything. So um, my name is Janta Mosselman. I'm a program editor here at the Bali. Um, and I will briefly tell you uh, uh, something about our main guests and also about why we wanted to organize this program tonight. Um, so our main guest tonight is Sineb El Razoui. And she was born in Morocco. She has a master's degree in sociology of religion. Uh, she teaches at the uh, University Française d'Egypte. And during that time, she also started working as a journalist. Uh, she wrote about the conflict in Gaza. She wrote about human rights in, rights in Morocco. Um, and in 2009, she founded a movement called Mali. And it was a movement pro-democracy and pro-secularism. Um, she's been arrested three times by the Moroccan government because she criticizes it. And um, uh, after the Arabic Spring, uh, she fled the country and she started working for Charlie Hebdo. Um, she wrote a book, Destroying Islamic Fascism, uh, and it's been published by Prometheus and translated in Dutch, and you can buy it uh, this evening. So, as some of you might have noticed, Today is International Women's Day, um, which is a nice excuse to, to uh, listen to a woman or a woman if you don't do that often enough. But uh, what's a lot more important is, is that in this day and age, there are still women who cannot move around freely. Um, and they're threatened with violence if they speak out. And that concerns me, not because I'm a woman, but because I'm uh, a human being. And it should concern us all. So. Therefore, tonight, we are listening to the voice of such a woman. We're listening to Zinab El Razoui, who has been under immense threat and who's facing these threats and who's continuing to speak out, even if it means that a part of her freedom is being taken from her. Um, she is the bravest person I have ever met. She is incredibly smart, and I'm honored to have her here. Um, so there's also, uh, uh, before we continue with the program, there's a few practicalities I would like to share with you. Um, Yuri Albrecht is going to take over uh, in a bit. Um, he will tell you some other things and then Sina Belrazoui will give you a lecture. Um, she will be interviewed by Yuri Albrecht uh, and Raja El Mohandes will join the conversation. And after that, you will have the opportunity to ask a few questions. Um, I am not going to explain to you what a question is because I think you all know that deep inside. Um, if you are going to ask a question, uh, please wait for me till I come towards you with the microphone because this evening is live streamed. Um, and please also switch off your mobile phones. Uh, you can switch along, but uh, no sounds, please. Um, that was all. Thank you very much. And then I'll give the word to Juri Albrecht. Thank you, um, Jan de Mosselman. Uh, one of the editors of the Bali, the editor who did this 
is doing this program. Um, I'm not going to say very much, but I'm just going to say a few things about um, this evening, because it has been in the news for uh, the whole day. Um, it's very unfortunate, I have to say, that um, we have to organize these sort of evenings uh, on our own, but we're not on our own. Um, we have a group of uh, people supporting us, um, brave citizens who, who um, support us, who are able to who give us money and trust us so much that they trust us to invite the right people. It's a circle of friends who um, uh, make this possible. Otherwise, it would not have been possible, because um, uh, the security measures are so costly. The Dutch state doesn't want to support that at all. Um, and even today, just before we started, I got a message from the NCTV uh, saying that they base their decisions on rationality and not on emotions. I don't know what Van Hoof uh, thinks, with, uh, to, uh, thinks about this, but um, what does he say? That French are emotional, that Moroccans are emotional, women are emotional, that the director of the Bali is emotional? Well, I'm emotional about it, I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm really emotional about it. <laughs> Um, but uh, to say that on International Women's Day is quite, quite interesting, actually, I would, I would say. I mean, calling half of the population emotional. But um, anyway, um, he thinks it's a rational decision. And we're very happy that we have the circle of the free speech supporting us and we have uh, uh, citizens supporting us to make this possible. Um, and it's, uh, otherwise it's impossible, um, and I command the courage of Zinab El Razoui to come here without escort. Um, so to think that... Um, the conversation in this country can only be sustained by people who have the courage to do these sort of things. It's sort of rather rash, I would say, and disappointing. And um, because she has the courage to stand alone, and she has been doing that for many, many years now, um, I don't know whether Van Hove knows that one of the reasons to attack Charlie Hebdo was the fact that they did write things about Islam and that they wrote things by, um, and that she did write things because she studied this, she, because she's a soci sociologist and she has been working in this field for many, many years. So it's, um, it's uh, to the detriment of our intellectual conversation in this country that he don't want to defend this sort of things. And I think it's an outcry. And I think it's very commendable that um, a woman with extreme courage like Zainab el Razoui comes here and that she has the courage to speak about these things for years and years and write about it. And um, um, I think it's a, a bad sign that Dutch society doesn't want to uh, support that. She knows how, what it is to stand alone, and I will share one other story with you. I'm not talking about Grapperhaus, I'm not talking about Ollongren, I'm talking about Frans Timmermans. We've been called about a month ago by um, his office because he had many things to say on Women's Day and whether we could organize it. Well, of course we can. I mean, sure. Um, he wanted to explain how important women's rights are. He wanted to explain how much the European Union is concerned with those rights, and he wanted us to organize an evening with that, prefer preferably Carré or the big hall of uh, Stad Schouwburg next door, because, you know, it's not big enough here, but whether we could organize it? Well, yes, yeah, that's sure, I mean, you have things to say about women and on Women's Day. Um, yeah, yeah, it's important. He really feels about these sort of things. He likes to explain, you know, how important that is. I said, well, that's very, very nice, because we already invited half a year ago, we invited a woman who really, really, you know, knows about these things and really knows her, her stands her ground. So maybe you could come and comment on that and you could talk together. Well, that yeah, that's a bit disappointing that it was so small here, but yeah, sure, sure, that would be a very good idea. Actually, he would, he would think about it. So could you send some information? Yeah, yeah, so Jan de Mosselman sent some information. Could you send some more information? Yeah, sure, sure, Jan de Mosselman sent some more information. Uh, and then after a week, maybe she could send some more information. Oh, sure, sure, we can. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, you can search on the internet and you can find all her, all her speeches and her TED Talks and sure, but we sent them. And then they would, then for three weeks they said, tomorrow we will decide whether he comes and, you know, talks together with her about these things of, you know, women's rights and that sort of things. And then, just about ten days ago, they said, yeah, rather not. <laughs> you know, stand next to a woman who really, really has something to say, it's just, you know. <laughs> As a man, you know, it's, 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 it's you know, it's, it can be dangerous, I, I understand. Especially, you know, if you become emotional about it. So um, I just, I just uh, wanted to explain this to you because I'm very happy that you're here and, um, um, and to uh, the people who watch at home. But it was just as an introduction and I, I command the extreme courage of Zainab El Razoui that she's here and it's a great, great honor that she's here. And I give her the floor. Give a warm applause to Zainab El Razoui. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I really need that mic, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Raja. Thank you for this beautiful music. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Yante, for having organized this uh, wonderful event. Uh, thank, thank you to be here to listen to me. And I would like also to say thank you to those uh, scary guys you see here in the room because actually I don't say their names because they want to stay anonymous, but um, their work is also necessary, unfortunately, today in Europe because we need security now just to have such uh, gathering such as this one. Um, uh, before starting, I would like also to just uh, um, tell you that my English is not as good as uh, you may expect from me. So uh, sometimes my ideas will not be very precise, but uh, sometimes, sometimes I may hesitate. But believe me, it's not an intellectual hesitation. It's just a hesitation about the vocabulary uh, I try to find. Um, so I hope today, uh, when you will leave that, uh, uh, when you will leave the Bali, you will have, um, at least you will uh, see things more clearly. My work uh, is to try to bring more clarity uh, in all this intellectual confusion we have today in Europe about very important things such as uh, Islam, Islamism, what I uh, clearly call Islamic fascism also, terrorism, racism, uh, left, right, far right wing. Uh, people don't really know where to stand. They don't really know what they have to think about uh, these notions. I don't know if uh, uh, you, maybe some of you know my story. Um, maybe they know my story since I say I survived Charlie Hebdo attacks, but actually uh, no one uh, landed in Charlie Hebdo because, uh, because, I mean, the journalists who used to work in Charlie Hebdo, they didn't, they were not uh, hired there because they just sent their CV. Um, almost all of us landed there because uh, we had a struggle before and uh, my struggle since I was a child, was a struggle as a Muslim-born girl to uh, say that I deserve the same rights as uh, everyone, as men, but I also think that in the country where I grew up, even men, they don't really uh, enjoy the rights they should enjoy, but as a woman, you even enjoy less rights. So my struggle was to was a, a perpetual revolt against that situation where I was. And because I refused to uh, just uh, uh, obey what the society wanted. Um, so I landed uh, in Charlie Hebdo because of this struggle in Morocco for secularism and because of this struggle in Morocco for democracy. And I believe that in the Muslim countries, democracy will never be possible as long as we don't also get rid of the dictatorship of superstition and religion. I always say that to uh, the Muslims in the Muslim countries I visit. I tell them, guys, you will never enjoy democracy. Don't think that you can rid, that you can get rid of dictatorship if you don't get rid also of uh, the totalitarianism of religion. I believe it goes together. It goes. Uh, um, it, th there is no there is no democracy possible if we believe in that dictatorship in the sky who is uh, uh, who prefers men to women, who is not respecting our freedoms. So um, after Charlie Hebdo attacks, uh, uh, when my colleagues were killed, we thought at the time that the worst the worst thing happened and that nothing worse can happen. But actually we were mistaken because we understood very quickly in France uh, that actually uh, the worst will maybe uh, just start. Um, 
of course we had this wonderful march in Paris and everywhere in France where millions of people protested uh, peacefully without any single racist uh, affiche in the demonstrations. No one did something wrong. All the people were just demonstrating for the freedom of speech. But immediately after that, we again had this um, unbearable and ugly debate about, yeah, maybe Charlie Hebdo went too far, maybe the guys deserved it, etc. Some people at the time fell again in the trap. Yeah, maybe Charlie Hebdo deserved that. Maybe we are the embodiment of the evil uh, of every bad thing in Europe, and maybe we deserve to be killed. But a few uh, months later, we had the 13th November uh, attacks. And so people, start, people started to say, so uh, the guys who were just watching a football game in the Stade de France, or those who were just sitting drinking a beer in a terrace, or those who were listening to music in the Bataclan, did, we, did they also deserve it? Did, did they also go too far? And uh, some people, some intelligent people started to recognize that actually terrorism is a blind thing and uh, that terrorism is um, built on an ideology and this ideology is a, an ideology of hatred. And my work since uh, that day is just to uh, say what no one wants to say in Europe. Uh, let me start with a few notions, with something called Islamophobia. Huh? Some of you may think that Islamophobia is a bad thing. That's what we are being told. No, Islamophobia is a bad thing. But actually, let's think about what is Islamophobia. Islamophobia as a word, uh, is, uh, it, it seems like a disease, you know. It's a phobia, it's a irrational fear. Something, a phobia is a fear that is not rational. While actually, if we question ourselves, we might find that the fear of Islamism is a quite rational fear. And this word of Islamophobia entered the French dictionary, the La Rousse, uh, a few years ago as uh, hostility against Islam, comma, the Muslims. It means that there is no difference between uh, hostility against ideas and against people, which is absurd. Because criticizing ideas shouldn't mean criticizing people. If I criticize Islam, it doesn't mean that I hate every single Muslim person at an individual level. So Islamophobia is being used now as a tool to shut the mouths of every person who is criticizing Islam in Europe. I say in Europe, in the West, but not in the Muslim world, because Islamophobia doesn't exist in the Muslim world. Why? Because in the Muslim world, uh, I can say that no Muslim country, unfortunately, is a democracy. And most of the Muslim countries are Islamic theocracies, where the religion has the power, where it, it rules the state. And actually, when you criticize Islam in a country ruled by Islamic law, you are not accused of being Islamophobic. You were legally tried, accused of being an apostate, of committing blasphemy, and so you are either jailed, whipped in a public place, uh, humiliated, um, um, I mean, you go to exile or you are killed, which is the case of several uh, Muslim-born intellectuals who were living in Muslim countries, they were killed, put in jail, some of them are still in jail, uh, Several examples, Raif Badawi, the Saudi blogger, uh, um, uh, Sheikh Waldem Khitir, the, the Mauritanian blogger, uh, Nawal Sadawi had problems, this uh, uh, Jordanian intellectual who was killed the day he was tried for blasphemy, uh, Faraj Fouda, the Egyptian uh, secular intellectual who was killed also in Cairo. Many, many, many people had this kind of uh, problems. So when the same free and secular people, Muslim-born people, come to the West and they just want to continue to say the same things, criticize Islam, criticize Islam as a dogma, as a religion of state, uh, uh, as an idea, and as an ideology, uh, they find themselves here in Europe accused of being 
Islamophobic. Because actually, the Islamists who rule uh, a big part of the world and who have legal tools to try or to jail or to kill or to whip those who criticize them, here in the West, they have no one of these legal tools. The only tool they have is putting their hand on their heart with a tear in their eyes and say, you're hurting my feelings with what you say. I feel hurt. This is racist. And actually, we should all remember that the right of not being hurt does not exist. Only the right to free speech exists. Uh, we should also remind them that Islamophobia is the other face of the same medal with blasphemy. Where they have the legal tools to shut the mouths, they don't use Islamophobia accusation. They use accusation of blasphemy. And we can also ask ourselves, as Europeans, why the hell someone who is Christian born, why, why when he criticizes Christianism, he is not called Christianophobic, then supposedly racist and see the so-called Christian race or the white race, or I don't know how to call it. Why? Why do the Westerners deserve the right to the Lumière, Voltaire spirit, uh, uh, I mean, uh, sense of criticism? Why do they deserve the right to, Christ, to, Christ, to criticize their own religious heritage and why this right is denied to the free people among the Muslims? It should be the same. So this Islamophobia accusation is being used today and many people want to, uh, to, to say that the Islamophobia is the new racism. Well, actually, I really wonder if a person who is racist, anti-black people, would accept more easily a black, black person who is Christian than a black Muslim person. I think that it is not serving the anti-racist anti uh, struggle to reduce it to uh, religion. Um, in the book I, uh, I wrote, and which is just published uh, now in uh, Dutch, I tried to, uh, to speak about what I call one of the worst intellectual impostures of nowadays, this Islamophobia. And I tried to uh, find uh, the answers. I tried to deconstruct all the speech and the strategy of Islamization used by the Islamists to, Islamis to Islamize Europe. So they use notions as anti-racism, uh, to shut our mouths, but actually, let us have a look uh, into their ideology. They are the most racist persons I know, actually, the Islamists. When they claim to accuse, when they accuse those who criticize them of being racist, actually they are not really standing anti, uh, anti the racism. They just want the monopole of racism for themselves, because when they are racist, when they say our daughters can never marry Jewish or Christian guys, uh, they consider that it's not racism. It's in the religion. It's allowed and it's, uh, it's uh, God's, uh, it, God wants that. So it's not racism. Well, actually for me it is. Um, those people, unfortunately, have uh, found here in the West many elites who are helping them to grow and to spread. Uh, I was very disappointed as a woman who grew up in a Muslim country. I spent my whole life struggling in a daily basis just to have a little bit of the freedoms you were born with here in the West. The freedom of wearing this, for instance. Even the freedom of putting lipstick and nail polish, sometimes it can be problematic. A girl who is doing that, it, it means that she wants to attract men and it's not really good to do that. The freedom of uh, having a love story, of going out. Uh, these are the daily freedoms. I'm not talking about the rights. When you are born as a Muslim woman in a Muslim society, you, don't, you definitely don't have the same rights as men. 
For instance, now, if my father has a piece of land or a, a flat in Morocco, my, my brother inherits double. I only inherit the half because I am a woman. Well, actually, I pay my coffee and my taxes, same as him. Uh, so this daily struggle for very simple uh, rights, such as drinking a beer after work, having a love story, choosing one's own sexual orientation, etc., are denied to us. And we are struggling just to get some of the few of the rights you have here in Europe. And when we come here to the West, and we try to defend these rights because we believe that rights and values are universal, that they are for everyone in this earth and not only for the West. For me, equality between men and women is not a Western value. It's a universal value. Freedom of choosing one's sexual orientation is not a Western value. It's a universal value. But when we come here to the West, we are surprised to find that those who are supposed to support us Actually, they support our oppressors. Uh, they support our oppressors because they don't want to be assimilated to the far right wing. They think that it is um, anti-racist to practice this form of cultural relativism. And I have to add that the worst form of racism I uh, could see in Europe is exactly this cultural relativism. What is cultural relativism? Cultural re relativism is the fact of saying, yes, okay, we Westerners, we are for equality between men and women. We are for uh, gays rights, uh, LGBT rights. We are for freedom of speech, freedom to criticize religion, but we will let the Muslims do it differently. We have to respect their culture and let them veil their women. Let them uh, violate these values. They are not ready for that. They don't really deserve these values. Isn't that the definition of racism? Why the hell do you think that the Muslims don't deserve also those values? There is people who are risking their life in the Muslim world for those values. So this cultural relativism is for me one of the worst uh, swords of racism that are now practiced in Europe. Because the classical racism, the silly and stupid racism, let's say someone who will say, I don't know, Arabs, uh, uh, niggers, rouse, or that kind of person will always exist. And in most of the European democratic countries, racism is not an opinion, it's a crime, it's forbidden by the law. And this is a very good thing, by the way. It's just like uh, assassination. It's forbidden by the law. Rape is forbidden by the law, but you will still have people who kill and people who rape. This is something we can't avoid, but those countries are forbidding racism. But this sort of racism that pretends to be anti-racism is actually one of the worst forms of exclusion. And it is actually uh, helping the oppressors in the Muslim world. Those people, mainly from the left, but not only from the left, also from the right, from the center. Those people, you find them in political elites, in journalistic elites, those who have never left the hipster uh, corners of Amsterdam or the Bobo uh, uh, 11th arrondissement of Paris, and they give us lessons about the fact that we should be more, we should be nicer with the Islamists. We should accept the niqab and the burqa as a cool thing. Actually, I invite them to go to spend six weeks in Asyut, in Beni Mellar, in Jalalabad, in a city like that, and they will see what is the final project of Islamists. They will see if they can cope really with the daily life in an Islamist country. Those people, <clears throat> those people actually, if they are taking this position because they don't want to be identified as a far-right wingers, I should remind them that the Islamists are the far right wing in our countries. In every Muslim country, when you look at the political exchequer, the far right wing is the Islamists. They are the far right wing. And I can also say that they have a lot of similarities 
with the traditional European far right wing. Of course, they don't have the same project of society at all. They are not struggling. They are not fighting for the same society, but they have the same dialectic tools and they have the same vision of the society. For them, people are not the people do not have the same rights and the society is uh, made of different communities and those communities do not enjoy the same rights. So we should every time remind the far right wing that uh, we are not um, blind, that we read, uh, uh, we read what the far right wingers are doing. Let me, uh, let me give an example. In many countries, debates about secularism, about equality between men and women, were completely abandoned by the left to the far right wing. And so we now arrive to a bipolarization of the society. We find ourselves in a situation where we have to choose. Either we are defending Islamists or we stand with the far right wing. But actually, there is a big space in the middle. There is uh, an infinity of possibilities of shades in the middle. And struggles such as secularism, such as human rights, such as equality between men and women, such as sexual freedom, have always been uh, um, led by the left historically. So what have happened to the left? And at a personal level, I still describe, I still define myself as a woman from the left. But I don't recognize myself at all in this Islamo uh, left, in this left that is trying to convince us that the veil is a symbol for freedom and that we should accept it as an evolution of the society. Actually, it might be an evolution, but not in the right way, not towards the future, but it's a backgroundness, actually. So. Uh, I just want to, uh, I don't want to be too long because it's, uh, I, I don't really um, like monologues. I much more prefer questions and answers. But uh, I would like to um, conclude by speaking about the title of my book. Why do I talk about Islamic fascism? Many people tell me, oh, that's too, oh, that's too violent. Are you sure? Uh, how do you call that fascism? I say it's, yeah, it is something that we can scientifically, academically, methodologically call a fascism. Let me tell why. First of all, uh, there is now, in a way that we cannot deny, a fascist ideology growing inside the Islamic civilization. And unfortunately, each time we have a terrorist attack in Europe, you have a lot of politicians who say, this has nothing to do with Islam. So I, I just want to ask them, so it has to do with what? With Buddhism? Uh, or, you know, many of our politicians cannot start a sentence about Islam without saying, uh, uh, pay attention, uh, Islam is a religion of peace and love, of course. So uh, is it, then it is the only religion of peace and love, actually, officially, because yeah, I don't know why Islam is a religion of peace and love. I, know, I don't know any other religion of peace and love, actually. Uh, it means that there is a problem with Islam, but people are afraid of naming the problem by its name. And by not naming it, they are actually making it worse. This ideology is a fascism because it has all the technical characteristics of a fascism. Let me give a few examples. In all the traditional fascisms, there is this blind veneration of the chief, of the leader. Uh, in Islam, the figure of the prophet Muhammad as the perpetual leader and chief of the ummah is completely sacred and untouchable. And we've seen the last guys who tried to just joke with this figure what happened to them? Uh, another uh, similar, another shared and common characteristic between this fascist ideology, this Islamofascism and the traditional fascisms is the very repressive sexism 
against women and homosexuals. Uh, and I think that no one can deny this. And in Islam, we can even see that this sexism against women wants to erase, to make women disappear from the public space, cover them with black uh, garbage bags. Um, another common characteristic between uh, Islamofascism and the other fascisms is the fact of pretending before arriving to power that uh, this ideology has some social concerns about workers, social rights, etc. Uh, but actually, uh, whenever uh, a form of Islamic fascism could arrive to power, let's say in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, in, in a more attenuated form, in all the countries where you have an, Islamist, an Islamic theocracy, I talk about Morocco, about Egypt, uh, about uh, many other countries where Islam rules the society, actually once the Islamists arrive to power, they treat the left and the workers like no one. We can see what the Iranian mullahs regime did to the two-day communist party in Iran. We can see how the Saudi economy or the Qatari economy treats the workers. Actually, I think it's the, their last, uh, their last, uh, the, the last thing they, they manage is the workers. And it's a real ultra liberal, liberal economy. Uh, and more generally, each time you have Islamists on the power, their first enemy is the leftists. Uh, another common characteristic between traditional fascisms and Islamofascism is this deep hatred against art and intellectuals. Another characteristic proving that we are facing a fascism, an Islamofascism, is the fact that this ideology is a complete totalitarianism. It doesn't tolerate any diversity, any different point of view. Another uh, characteristic of fascisms. All the fascisms had militias, either official militias or unofficial militias committing crimes, ideological crimes. So the terrorists, aren't they a militia? Aren't they people killing in the name of an ideology? They are. Another characteristic of fascism, the fact of having a flag, having a costume, having a ready to think, are ready to speak. In this fascism, we have a flag. Now it's the ISIS flag. Before it could be Al Qaeda flag. We have like a costume. Women have to wear like the, the black garbage bag, and the guys they have to wear the Wahhabi dishdasha in, in white and the beard. You know, it it kills any um, cultural diversity, any freedom, even in the costume. Even the way they speak is the same way. Don't think that the young who embrace this ideology, they speak what they, their grandparents used to speak when they are originally from a Muslim country. They might be originally from uh, here also, but they learn to speak this ready to speak. Another characteristic also uh, is uh, the fact of um, uh, destroying any political uh, system that brings diversity. And this is actually, and, and the fact also of being um, an imperialist ideology. And today, Islamofascism is definitely an imperialist ideology because it wants to spread, it, it, it's meant to spread everywhere. They want to spread. For this ideology, the world is divided into two parts, Darul Islam and Darul Harb, the house of Islam and the house of the war. Everywhere where Islam doesn't rule, it means that is the house of the war. So let me conclude with that. Uh, I still have a lot of things to say, but uh, I will uh, maybe start the conversation with Yuri. He will be inspiring me and <laughs> opening new, uh, new brackets and new subjects. And uh, after that, I'll be happy to answer all your questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, uh, uh, speak, you. for your for your talk, for your um, uh, um, for your words. Um, you don't speak with notes. You just speak right away. Yeah. When I speak with notes, I just become very boring mm -hmm. because I read, and yeah, I prefer to speak. Yeah, yeah. Like no, it, it goes extremely well. Um, um, we uh, we asked uh, uh, um, we we sent your manuscript to Prometheus and they just pr uh, um, published this book uh, yesterday your book um, uh, uh, Vernietig het islamitisch fascisme heet het in Nederland and um, um, that's a Dutch title of it um, and a lot of the things you're talking you talked about are uh, in your book as well um, I I I want to start off with um, a, a question about um, the, the, the totalitarian ideology you uh, describe and you call Islamofascism. Um, it sounds horrible. It sounds really bad. It sounds... Um, uh, but how come would you say that it has, especially in a lot of Western cities, but also probably in a lot of places like Pakistan and Afghanistan, how come that so many people are attracted to it? It sounds like your worst nightmare. Do you have any explanation for that? Actually, I don't really have an answer for that because actually I, yeah, I, I still don't know how today the world is fearing a bunch of guys who think that they can hear the cancer by camel piss or who they think that after committing a terrorist attack they will just fly to the sky and have 70 or 67 versions. Uh, I personally don't really understand, but I can have some uh, uh, um, some starts of uh, some reflection about that. Uh, in the Muslim countries, uh, there is no single Muslim regime that is a democracy. Even the former dictatorships in the Muslim world, uh, uh, they were not like theocratical, severe regimes, but they were somehow built on religion. Even those who pretended to be secular regimes like Saddam Hussein one, Bashar al-Assad one. But those regimes, they destroyed every hope in the societies. They destroyed the individual. They destroyed arts, intellectuals. They destroyed the youth. They destroyed science. They told people, you want to learn how to read? And how to write, take a Quran, learn, but don't learn critical spirit, don't learn Voltaire, don't learn philosophy, don't learn sociology, don't learn your history, because if you learn your history, you will make political problems in the country. So in the Muslim world, there is a very spread and collective feeling of frustration, because people in these societies feel that they failed in everything. They failed in democracy, in human rights, in economy, in science, in culture, in sport. They failed military. So there is a very, very collective feeling of, of um, uh, frustration. And I think that uh, this is one of the reasons why this ideology, who is pretending to bring some pride to, uh, to uh, these people is having a kind of success. But this is very temporary because I believe that no fascism could win at uh, a historical uh, uh, scale and all the fascisms will definitely uh, go to the um, garbage of, his, of the uh, history of ideas. It can take a long while though. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, you, um, you make another comparison um, uh, between um, um, uh, fascist movements and Islamofascism because you say that the, um, they both lack the idea of citizenship. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Because, um, I mean, people in, in Arab countries or in Muslim countries do have a passport. or I mean, they, they are citizens. So what's the, what's the how come... Um, they, they deny the idea of citizenship, you write, and um, they, they prefer uh, the group, one yeah, leader of in the course. group. In the Islamofascist ideology, 
the kind of ideology you, you, you will find with ISIS guys, and the individual does not exist. You only exist as a member of the group. Uh, and this is also a characteristic that the other fascisms have. The individual has no meaning. The individual is a part of a bigger thing. And actually, this is how fascism start. A fascism needs to uh, make people believe that they belong to a persecuted group and that this group has to stand for his rights. All the fascisms started somehow like this. They are pretending to give a kind of pride to the group and that everyone has a role in the group, but this everyone has no meaning as an individual. So, uh, and in the Islamic societies generally, the individual does not exist and especially if this individual is a woman. And you, you say the concept of ra'idya. Ra'idya, yeah. yeah. The ra'idya, uh, it's a theological concept. Uh, I mean, the citizen does not exist. You are, uh, the, the, the people are a ra'idya. I can translate that in French, but I don't know if I can translate it in English. Let's try. They are <laughs> subjects, actually. I, I think that might be the nearest translation. Are they are um, um, subjected? They're yeah, they are subjects, like subjects to the king. Yeah. You know? There are no citizens. There exactly. Are no... Okay, and, you, you, and you, you draw that comparison. I mean, would you, would you go as far because, um, would you go as far as calling the religion fascist or would you say it's Islamo-fascism? Is there a difference? Uh, for me, uh, there is, uh, we, we first have to define what is Islam. In France, uh, in French, if we write Islam with a capital letter, we mean the civilization, the geographic space where Islam exists. And it means the whole civilization, the costumes, the languages, the music, the music. everything uh, uh, from this part of the world. If we write Islam with a small i, it means we're talking about the religion, only the religion, as a, dog, as a religious dogma, as a practice, as Sharia rules, Quran, Sunnah, etc. Uh, for me, definitely, Islamofascism uh, is uh, deeply based on uh, Islamic, with a small i, rules, uh, read to the letter, practice to the letter, and it is using all the ingredients it can find in the Islam with a, with a capital letter. In the culture. Yeah, in the culture. And there is today a deep philosophical crisis in the Islamic civilization. And all the Muslim intellectuals recognize that. And they are the first people who are concerned with that. If you read the secular people in Egypt or in Iraq or in, uh, even in the Gulf, uh, in uh, Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in North Africa, they are, it is their main concern to say we, have, we are uh, going through dark times and we have a deep uh, philosoph philosophical crisis in our civilization. Uh, but unfortunately, this uh, knowledge to analyze uh, the Muslim world is uh, lacking uh, in the West, especially uh, uh, among the, those who, um, who support the Islamists as if, as if they were the uh, legitimate representatives of the Islamic culture. Uh, so it is... Uh, uh, for me, undeniable that there is a fascist ideology growing inside Islam. And this civilization also can produce fascism. The European civilization produced fascisms not so uh, far ago in, uh, in the time. So why is it shocking to think or to suppose or to say that there is a fascism in the Islamic civilizations? How do we want this fascism not to grow in countries that, were, that have been denied their rights during decades. So you would say it's growing inside it, it's not the same. You would say there is a fascism growing inside um, um, uh, um, Islamic countries or within Islam, but it's not the same as fascism. 
It is. I mean, uh, fascism is not. The, I mean, the religion is not the same as fascism as a whole. You would. Uh, actually, uh, the religion is not. The re all the religions, in the, in my opinion, are not much better than fascism. Just su suppose. Suppose here we are in a society that is traditionally Christian. Just suppose one second if we want to practice Christianism to the letter here in uh, Holland. We will automatically forbid divorce, contraception, uh, uh, sex without marriage. I mean, it will be uh, a fascism also. Religions are uh, like a group of ideas of people who were flying in the sky and walking in the water and I don't know and Islam in itself I mean Islam with a small eye what is it it's a a, a, a a group of rules of laws written 15 centuries ago by the Bedouins in the desert uh, in itself I have no problem with that it's a part of the ideas of the human history but the problem is some guys in 2018 pretend that this must be our constitution and that these rules must be applied in our societies nowadays, which is a problem. It doesn't matter what is the rule. And I want to quote Sharp, the former editor-in-chief of Charlie Hebdo. He, was, he used to say, even a cuisine book, if you apply it to the letter with violence, it can become a war book. If I say, okay, if you don't put two spoons of sugar, I'll kill you, it can become a dangerous book. So... <laughs> Everything you apply to the letter becomes a fascism. Of course. If you if you use a book for it. And yeah. Especially if it's a thing written 15 centuries ago by guys who, who were riding camels and uh, yeah. I think it's very interesting what you say that if we think that European civilization could breed fascism, why do we think that other civilizations cannot breed fascism? Exactly. Of course. Um, uh, it's, it's sort of an arrogancy to think that only the European countries can breed fascism. And you were going into what you call the sort of worst kind of racism you met coming to Europe and being very surprised about it, that the light of enlightenment, that the, the right to criticize your religion, your political system, your upper class, your, um, is a, a right which is um, beholden to the Europeans and to people living in Paris and Amsterdam and denied to the women who grew up in Morocco, like yourself. Um, you would call that a racism? Can you explain it a little bit more? You talk a lot about it in the book. Yeah, for me, uh, the anti-racist movement today in Europe is uh, clearly uh, uh, split onto two parts. There is a shift in the anti-racist uh, uh, approach uh, of the society. We still fortunately have the universal anti-racism, the, the kind of anti-racism that considers that all people have same rights and same duties in the same society, regardless of their origin, their skin color, their uh, spiritual belief, etc. And actually anti-racism is something that tends to uh, erase differences between people. But now we have another kind of something pretending to be an anti-racism approach also. This anti-racism wants to underline the differences between people and to say that actually people don't, do not enjoy the same rights. They enjoy different rights according to their cultures, their traditions, etc. While actually, I feel uh, that we really have to pay attention with this cultural approach. Uh, cultures in their uh, peaceful uh, 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 existence are really useful to the society. And we're all happy in Europe to live in countries where can, we can listen to a song in Arabic, where we can go out and eat in an Indian restaurant or a Japanese restaurant. It's a treasure for us. But just imagine a society where all the, the legislations from these countries exist. I always give an example. When the people, for instance, start talking about the veil uh, and just say that, yeah, the veil is okay, it's a freedom, etc. I, I tell them, let us suppose something. Suppose that the African immigration was something very recent in Europe. 
maybe that the society now will be asking itself, should we allow polygamy? Polygamy is a matrimonial, a familiar, uh, family way of existing that is completely accepted in many African societies, even accepted sometimes by the women. But here in Europe, it is forbidden. Why? Because our societies think, and they are right, that we have a value that is more important that, than the right of certain families to practice their culture. This value is equality between men and women. And if we respect equality between men and women, we don't allow polygamy. So just transpose that rule for, for the other debates. Shall we uh, say that polygamy is something that we should accept in the name of the respect of the cultures? So why not uh, accept genital mutilation also? Why not then? Huh? I think that in our societies, we, were not, we, we, wouldn't, we, we mustn't be ashamed of the values we have. We are for equality between men and women. We are for the fact of uh, permitting to certain guys to treat their women like uh, shit because it's in their culture. We don't respect that kind of culture. And when it comes to human rights, I'm sorry, all the cultures are not equal. Human rights are universal and are also deserved by people who live under those cultures and who take, who risk their lives for those rights. So we shouldn't accept things that violate our values in the name of any religion or of any culture. But we... In those um, values we have is also the freedom of choice, for instance, to wear a thing around your head and to, to believe things uh, other people don't believe. So how, do you, how does that fit in? Actually, I want to remind that the best frame, the best legal frame for religion, for freedom of religion, is a secular society. And sometimes I tell the French Islamists, who are like all the day against secularism. They hate secularism. I tell them, guys, if this society wasn't secular, you as Muslims, you will have to pay a tax to the Catholic Church to have the right to ex exert, to practice your religion. And the guys just say, oh, so well, yeah, 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 you're right. Um, <laughs> uh, that's uh, one thing. The second thing now is this freedom of choice. Actually, uh, as you were talking about the veil specifically, uh, I, have, I find it very, very difficult to put the word veil and the word freedom in the same sentence. Because either we accept it or no, the veil is compulsory for hundreds of thousands of millions of women in this world. If they don't wear it, they are jailed or they are whipped in the public place. So I can't understand that is, it is being used for some people here as a symbol of freedom. It is not. Okay, I can understand that the women who wear the veil are not all obliged by a man to wear it. They decided to wear it. Uh, is it really a choice? At a philosophical level, I doubt of that. I want to quote a uh, an Algerian feminist, Wasila Tamzali, uh, this woman uh, during the uh, uh, civil war in the 90s in Algeria, where the society was continuously attacked by Islamists, this woman has seen hundreds of thousands of Algerian women making simultaneously the free choice to wear the veil. And so she is authorized to ask herself, <laughs> is this really a free simultaneous choice? Why is it, is it, is it being done massively? And Wasila Tamzali found the word, the expression I've, I've been looking for for years. She said the veil is not a choice, it's a consent. And actually, I think she is right. What I can say regarding the veil, it is, in my opinion, a mistake to reduce the debate about the veil to the simple legal point of view. Shall we allow it or shall we forbid it? 
The Islamists always want to reduce any debate to a legal debate. For me, the question is not allowing it or forbidding it. Because actually, the veil is not forbidden in Europe. If you go out here in the street, you will see many women wearing it in France, in Belgium. In France, the niqab is forbidden, but not the veil. So what's the problem? Why do we still have this debate? Because the women who wear the veil don't want the society only to authorize it. No, they want the society to consider it as normal, as a good thing, as a normal thing. While I can understand that the society does not recognize as a normal dress something that is compulsory for hundreds of millions of women in the world. I can maybe consider the veil as a normal dress. The day where the Saudi woman can wear it on Sunday and wear uh, something else on Friday. But as long as it is compulsory for women, I will always feel much more concerned about the woman who don't want to wear the veil in countries where it is compulsory by the law, than women who wear it here where it's not forbidden, actually. So I don't think that the, the veil should be banned because I, I don't think that we should ban anything that doesn't please us in a society. But I think that at least we should identify it as it is. It is a visual sign of an ideology. It is a political choice. Some women may say it's a spiritual choice. I prefer not talking about the veiled woman. I always talk about the veil, not about the women who wear it, because there is several cases. And as a feminist, for me, the veil is a sexist thing. It's a piece of material that is meant to hide the beauty of women, to avoid men having erections. This is the veil, actually, in its uh, definitions. And uh, it is something that is supposed to come from the Sharia. But let me just conclude about the veil from the Sharia. Let's talk now from the Sharia. In Islam, there is sartorial obligations for men. In Islam, there is this theological notion called the aura. The aura is all the part of the body that is concerned by uh, modesty. The aura of a woman is everything but her face and her hands. Quite a lot. Yeah, in the Sharia. The aura of a man, because Muslim men have an aura also. The aura of a man in the Islamic religion goes from the top of the belly button to under the knees. All this part of the body mustn't be shown. So when we had this Burkini debate uh, last in France, month, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we did not see any burkalson, like strange swimming suits for men, in the European beaches. When we see a woman with the niqab or the burkini, we, we see her man, he's wearing the same quicksilver uh, fashion uh, swimming suit as the infidels. Muslim men are not allowed to, to wear silk. They are not allowed to wear silver, to wear gold, and to have long hair, longer than the ears. But we've never seen a demonstration, let's say, of the workers in a factory who say, we are obliged to wear uniforms with the silk fibers. We have never seen a jewelry shop attacked by, by Islamists because uh, the jewelry was selling uh, gold or silver rings to, to men. It means that no one gives a damn about the sartorial obligations for men in Islam. It's only about women. And I want to tell those women so who are... So it's an excuse to discriminate against women, you Of say. course. And that's what I tell to these European girls who were born with many rights here and who choose to wear something from the past. I tell them, if you, compl com you complain here continuously because you are not accepted with the veil, so think of those who are not accepted without a veil in the, in the other countries, and you will understand that the problem actually is with women. It's an excuse to discriminate against women. Of course, and unfortunately, many women fall in that trap, and they auto-persecute themselves. I don't know why uh, this question of veil is taking as much importance. It becomes like an identity thing for certain Muslim girls. And we will never see a Muslim uh, guy, even, if when he, even when he is radical, 
who will uh, torture himself with sartorial uh, details. Okay, so you're saying, you're saying um, I'm not concerned with not allowing it. It should be allowed, but it's the discourse around it. I don't it, say it should be allowed. I say it shouldn't be banned. It's quite different. That is, that's quite different, yeah. absolutely. And, um, uh, and the same for religion, for freedom of religion. Because you're saying laïcité is a good thing, actually, because you're more free in it. But b that means that you have the right to, to believe in your belief system, yeah, yeah even if it's violent or near fascist? Or no, no belief has the right to violate the law. Actually, uh, uh, secularism is a system allowing all the religions to exist. And for instance, the laïcité in France, many people want to criticize this laïcité. They can, some people describe it as if it was also an ideology and a religion. It is not. It is simply a legal system saying that the state has no religion, no color, and the state doesn't fund any cult. You want to have your cult, you're free to have your cult, but you finance it. The state doesn't finance any cult. The public money doesn't go to the cults. This is the laïcité, actually. You have a religion, it's your right, and the state will protect this right, but please don't bring, don't oblige the others to practice your religion, which is quite normal. So, uh, I would like to say that the Islamists are using those notions of secularism, of democracy, of anti-racism. Well, actually, those notions, they didn't contribute to. Ask them about the same notions in any Islamic country. Do any Islamic country respect the freedom of faith? I was born in Morocco, and in our constitution we have a sentence like freedom of faith. But actually, if any Moroccan person converts to Christianism, let's say, if you go and enter the church, there is a policeman at the, the, the church sitting, hey guy, you're too brown to enter the church, it's for the foreigners. And one day I asked a political responsible in Morocco about freedom of religion, and he said, well, the foreigners, they have the freedom. So I said, but the constitution is written for the people of the country, not for the tourists. And um, so no, no single Islamic state allows this freedom uh, of faith. Only a secular system allows it. So uh, I think that uh, in a society where you have different uh, religions, different cultures, people coming from different backgrounds, the, a secular system is the only warranty to those people to enjoy the same rights and same duties and to have the right to practice their own belief as long as this belief doesn't violate the law. You were prosecuted in your country, in Morocco. You were arrested. You had to flee your country. Uh, you came to Paris. You became a Parisian intellectual. You, um, and then you uh, uh, lived through sort of the worst possible scenario where they killed all your colleagues and friends. Um, you just described yourself as uh, somebody from the left. But um, you also described vividly in the book and in your speech how the left sort of left you, um, how um, uh, people you thought you would be on your side um, uh, didn't sustain uh, your beliefs and actually uh, asked, you know, a few weeks after the killings of the, of the Charlie Hebdo um, uh, um, journalists, whether they deserved it or not. Um, I just cannot um, think about how horrible that would be if you flee somewhere and you come to a place and it becomes the place you're, f you're fleeing from. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I think that those who think that the boundaries can block the problem, they are completely mistaken. I just think of uh, the Hungarian uh, state now, you know, or about the Muslim ban of Trump. You know, he thinks that by closing the boundary, America will be okay. Uh, this is completely stupid as an idea. Ideologies have no boundaries. And that's the same in France. Every time we have a terrorist attack, we have Francois Hollande or his ministers saying, we will enforce the, the bombings in Raqqa, as it, it, it is the solution to terrorism in France. And actually, 
I just want to tell him, if we erase Syria and Iraq from the map, it will not solve the problem, because the problem is here in our countries. It's our youth. Our, we, we are producing uh, this ideology also. Uh, you cannot close the boundary to an ideology, and you cannot also kill an ideology by weapons. They will never kill our freedom by weapons. They can just uh, like annoy us. They can kill some of us, but they will not really kill our soul and our, our will to be free. But at the same time, we cannot kill this ideology by weapons. We cannot only have a security and a military solution. The only way to get rid of this ideology is the ideology. It is on the ideological, on the ideas field that we will win. And we will win the day where our elites were, will understand that criticizing Islam is not being racist. And actually, many people now, many intellectuals, they gather and they discuss for hours how to de-radicalize those youth. Uh, they think that they can de-radicalize de them by, uh, I don't know, giving them medicines or talking to uh, psychologists or, I don't know. I, there is no scientific method, actually. And I only know one, one single, one, one and lonely single method to de-radicalize people. It's to liberate the criticism of Islam. How do you want to, uh, to um, uh, destroy an ideology if you don't allow yourself to criticize it, to talk freely about it? The only way to uh, get rid of this ideology is allowing the constructive and rational criticism of Islam just such as any other idea. And the problem is that our elites, and especially from the left, they are um, committing a, a very big political mistake and a historical mistake because they started to consider the Muslim community, and I put 100 brackets, because I have to talk about the Muslim community later, they are considering the Muslim community as a kind of new proletariat, as a kind of new, weak uh, people in the society that we have to protect. And actually, it is quite racist and unacceptable to reduce a whole group of people to a social category. Uh, it's not acceptable, and this is a, a very... Uh, important philosophical and political mistake of the left. I put uh, Muslim community between brackets because for me this is also a mistake. Muslims are not a community. They are individuals actually. I don't know what Muslim community means. It, it means that in the mind of those who use that term of community, that they are a group of people with the same needs, the same reality, the same belief, which is completely wrong. You have as much realities, as much individuals in this uh, so-called community. But the left also, the left who is supposed to uh, consider the Muslims uh, the, or the Muslim-born Europeans as normal citizens, enjoying the same rights, having the same capacities, and help those among them who are in difficulty because of the uh, immigration, heritage, immigration-related problems, etc. They just put them in this, uh, under this title of Muslim community and uh, listen to uh, uh, autoproclaimed representatives uh, of this, this uh, community who are the Islamists, who no one elected actually. Uh, but they are recognized by the left as representatives of the so-called Muslim community. This is a big political mistake, and the day where we'll, we will stop doing that, and we will stop accept autoproclaimed representatives of the Muslims, because actually in a democracy, the only way to represent someone is the vote, and the so-called Muslim representatives for the Muslim community who are generally guys, and who are sometimes guys like Tariq Ramadan, you see, who is jailed actually for being a serial rapist. Those guys, no one elected them. And those who are put under the Muslim community uh, name, maybe me, I don't know. If the Muslim community exists, so maybe I belong to that community in the eyes of this left, I don't know. Well, I'm atheist actually. So we have to refuse this categorization 
of the Muslims and the fact of considering them as a put, as a, as a, as a weak community that has to be protected. This is a very racist posture, actually. You said something in one sentence in between. You said they can kill some of us, but they cannot win in the end. Um, now, you have been under protection and under heavy protection. I have seen how you've been protected in Paris um, by many armed policemen. It's very interesting that you say that they can not overcome us. They can kill some of us. I mean, you realize that you could be killed. How do you cope with that? Yeah, sometimes I think uh, about that. I say maybe I can uh, be killed. Well, I'll tell something that is really funny. Uh, <laughs> I hope I will find the words in English. A few weeks later, I went to my bank in Paris and I found out that, that my banker have changed. And the new one didn't really know who I am, so I immediately subscribed a uh, uh, death insurance, you know, because I know that the former one who knows that I have a high risk of death would never <laughs> make this death insurance for me. So I said, at least if I'm killed, my daughter will get some money or my husband or so, someone. So yeah, this death idea, is, uh, is uh, permanently here, but it doesn't uh, really obsess me. Uh, um, I, don't, uh, I, I don't change anything to my daily life because uh, life has to continue. Uh, um, when, when, you, uh, when, you, when you survive to something such as Charlie Hebdo, actually, it is also, there is something very important after that, after this uh, suffering. You appreciate to be alive and you understand that actually life has a value and we should use it. And you know, as an atheist, uh, at a personal level, I don't believe in any kind of life after death. I believe only in two kinds of life after death. You continue to be alive if you have kids, they continue to have a part of you as a life and, uh, and you continue to live through them, or you continue, uh, you have a life after that uh, in your work, in the memories you have left, in what you have done during your life. So I enjoy uh, my life, I continue to see my friends, to do whatever I want to do, uh, when it is permitted by the security measures and I feel much more free in my mind than those who want to kill me and I, would, I don't want to exchange my life with them. I prefer my life, definitely. <laughs> I'm sorry to uh, upset you and ask you personal questions like that, but um, it, your answer is um, impressive. Um, I'd like to ask um, Raja El Mohandes to join us for a little bit and talk. Um, uh, would you care to? Um, microphone is working. Uh, otherwise, I'll. Oh, yeah, it's, it's working. working. Yeah. It's working, I'm sure. Um, and then we. Um, um, first, I'd like to, to ask you um, um, you listen to it, to the, to the speech, to the conversation. You have any direct comments or things you want to? Ed. Well, this is what a living hero looks like. So I think, oh. she, I think she deserves a big, big round of applause. And I think most of you have seen uh, the special on Newsuur. And I think the more people support Zeynep, the more, uh, more safe she will be. So I think it's very important that there's solidarity uh, because often we, uh, we don't imagine what a hero looks like. Um, and often we think that um, uh, strife, especially with religion, uh, is something very abstract, but it's very real. And I commend you because not only have you lost touch with the country uh, where you 
where you know what it is. Uh, then there was another one, which is people tried to cut off your, your freedom of speech in France. And I think those warning signs are ones that we need to listen to. And whatever aspect or whatever part of politics you support, left, middle, right, whatever, you need to listen and you need to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And you, um, uh, we um, organized uh, here at Bali, you organized here at Bali together with us an, uh, an evening with Mayit Nawaz. Yes. Um, very impressive evening as well. Um, but you would um, uh, consider yourself um, uh, um, a feminist, an activist, mm -hmm. a, um, but you would consider yourself a Muslim feminist, is that right? I'm a Sufist, so yeah. I, I love mysticism, and I think I can learn from everyone, and especially from people that do not agree with me. So, um, because I'm an artist, uh, I'm, I have a, a different way of looking at truths, and we are very emotional. <laughs> I think that's that's the word of the day. So I tend I tend to be very curious, uh, but I do believe in God. I think also because of my life path, and uh, but I absolutely defend everyone's right to not believe, because then you're a free person. And listening to them to this conversation to Zinab, what do you? Um, do you think like yes, but but that is that's really too negative about. Um, a religion or about Morocco or is there, or or would you tend to agree with most of it I agree with most of it because it's it's uh, it's well thought of and I think it's a lot of knowledge uh, I do think that the experience of growing up in Europe is different than growing up in Morocco Now you grew up here Yeah I grew yeah. up in Amsterdam and I think that that a lot of youth here use religion as a way to um, to fight uh, a perception that they have about racism. So they use religion and religious garments as, as a political tool, like maybe in the 70s or 80s, punkers would do. So I see a lot of Muslim youth, girls wearing a veil, but then taking it off a few years later. So I think around puberty, I think that's a very tender age for, for youth. I think even with Majid Nawaz, we saw that around his 15th, 16th age, that's when he was radicalized. And I think youth, especially now with media and mass media and algorithms, they get so much uh, toxic information given to them and not enough alternatives in pop culture. So I think that there is a, really a task for artists and for um, art producers um, to create content and to fight ideas also through storytelling. And that is something that I think as an artist I could add to the dialogue because um, I come from a, from a field where we offer an alternative. And what I see is that maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago when I saw after 9-11 what happened, I saw a lot of youth uh, become, becoming more um, fundamentalist in their experience of Islam and I, they would attack me because they couldn't, um, uh, how do you say it, understand that I would be and spiritual and, and an artist embracing pop culture. And what I see now, many of them come back to me. And uh, I, even with Majid Nawaz, when I met him, he was, uh, he just left his butahrir, he was still in this, in this, in this uh, duality. And the older I see him become, the more I see that he's becoming his authentic self. So I think with super diverse cities, especially here in Europe, that we do not have alternative stories and ways of producing stories and offering stories to marginalized youth. And I hope that this will, will be also one of the, the ways to reach a really uh, large part of, of these youth that are hijacked by Islamists through social media, through YouTube, because they're very good at marketing and they're very good at storytelling and they're hijacking the minds of our youth. And I think you cannot tackle that by um, only having intellectual, intellectual dialogues. You really need to, to, to do something with the arts. And, um... Thank you. 
I'm sometimes under the impression because both of you, um, uh, uh, we call yourself yourself feminist, working a lot for women's rights. I'm sometimes under the impression that, um, for one reason or the other, it seems that um, uh, new ideas uh, in Islam, on Islam, um, uh, in uh, Muslim communities, only come from women. Is that, for the biggest part, come from women? <laughs> I don't know. I, I know a lot of really cool dudes, you know, and, <laughs> and they're my friends and I work with them. But I think women at the moment are very angry and I think you need anger to raise your voice. And I think a lot of men are comfortable, so they don't feel like raising their voice because we could ruin their comfortable position. So I think maybe it's our, our time and age. And I think even in the West, you guys <laughs> are being challenged by women from the West. So... Mm -hmm. What would your take on that be? Yeah, actually, when people ask me why am I so angry, I say it's maybe because I was born a girl in a country where I was denied my rights as a girl. Maybe if I was a man, yeah, can have four wives, all the money, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but actually, no, I really also know many guys in the Muslim world who are really doing great, great job and doing it with a lot of courage. Yeah. yeah. But um, 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 then again, this, this, this whole problem of um, taking on um, Islamist radicals and having to do that within your community and having to look upon um, sort of the people who are well off or are in power or are like Franz Timmermans, um, who could do a lot, but not uh, backing you up. Yes. I mean, I wonder how that feels. I mean, well, many uh, approach me uh, in my DMs <laughs> or in private, but they, they also won't show up and support me. So I think, uh, who are the leaders? And I think um, politics is also a game. And I think um, that at the moment, I wouldn't know who, who they are because they don't show their face in public. And I think you need, I think the whole, uh, now the struggle with Islam and with uh, the, the extremes that we are facing now in Europe is such a big paradox, such a big dilemma, that I think we need a diversity of skills and, and methods to tackle it. And I don't think, uh, comfortable men in comfortable power positions are the ones to go to, especially when they only want to meet you in private. Or by DM. Yeah. <laughs> because even with uh, Majid, you know, it was the 15th anniversary of 9-11 and we did it here. And I was like, you know, I want to do it with some cool friends to also have some artistic dialogue about it and not only uh, listen to Majid. And there were politicians, Dutch politicians, approaching us that all wanted to meet Majid. And I was like, come, come to the event, show, show your support, show your support for me, I'm a local. And they wouldn't show up, but they w wanted to meet in private. So I think there's also something to say for, you know, who are brave people and who are cowards, or who are only brave on camera. And it doesn't matter to me whether you're Muslim or whether you're European or whatever. Brave is brave, and coward is coward. Yes. Yeah. I'm looking at the audience because we promised, um, I'm looking at the time as well, but we promised um, uh, that there would be time for questions or, and actually Jan Mosselman pointed out that it would be questions and no long statements. Um, is there um, somebody who Oh, the guy with the newspaper. Yeah, the, the guy with the newspaper, thank you. I'm, I'm using the newspaper for one moment. I mean, you have, in this interview in the NSA today, you make the quote the same, which you repeated already, that say, what can the Western society do in order, you know, to change this situation? Which you say, well, you have to call a spade a spade, as the English say, right? If this is a, a kind of a Nazism or a kind of fascism, whatever, you should call it that way. Now, the big question is, how come that you are referring to the leftists, to the journalism, to the elite, also in the middle of the multiculti, as we call it, the multi multicultural uh, stream movement, which we do find very strongly represented in the Netherlands? 
I'm trying to find, what is the basic idea that people are not prepared to stand up and not show up? The, the example you gave was Timmermans and many other examples. What's behind the scene that people are not willing and not prepared to stand up and call a spade a spade? Yeah. You should ask them, maybe. I don't know, we're yeah. here. Yeah, yeah so. we should ask them. And I think yeah. that what uh, Raja said is, is, is quite true. When they live comfortably in their uh, uh, cities, uh, European cities, where they go to the theater and they can go have a glass of wine and enjoy their freedom, they don't really dare to uh, understand the life of those who are uh, denied every, every uh, fundamental right. So, uh, and I think that today in Europe, for those who have something to lose, such as politicians and such as uh, those uh, media uh, elites, uh, it is a more, much more comfortable posture to say that Islam is a religion of peace and love than to say that there is a problem with Islam. Uh, no one uh, wants to, uh, to be shown as someone who is... Um, criticizing Islam, first of all, because I think everyone understood it's a bit dangerous, and also because there is a lot of demagogy, and uh, this is what I was describing. This left thinks that uh, uh, saying that Islam is a religion of peace and love is uh, being anti-racist, which is actually completely uh, wrong, and on the contrary, it is, it is racist. Um, I did a play once by uh, Rayana, an Algerian writer here in Holland. It's made into a film now. It was very hard to get it produced because all the intellectuals said it was based on Orientalism. Edward Said, could you elaborate on that? Because the argument, I had no answer to that. Uh I did not really understand what you said. You said you produced a movie and it was not broadcasted because it was uh, based on uh, Edward Said. It, it, uh, no, no, uh, it's Rayana. She's from Algeria mm -hmm. and okay. it was very uh, against uh, the political system and against Islam. It was very feminist. And here in Holland, they didn't want to produce it because they said it was based on Orientalism. Uh, yeah, but, well, what's that? When was that? Four years ago. Maybe you should shop further until you find a brave person. What's, what's Orientalism? What is that? It's just a word. Well, what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> what what, what does it means mean? is you were talking to the wrong investors or producers. You should shop further. So what, That's what uh, I would what do. <laughs> I don't think that Edward yeah. Said is exactly someone that we can call Orientalist. For me, Orientalists are, on the contrary, those who are in the West and who have this phantasm uh, about uh, the Orient and, uh, you know, who, uh, who, who, really, who consider uh, the Orient and uh, the Oriental women and the Oriental societies just as a phantasm. Uh, I think that those uh, elites we just spoke about are Orientalists, actually, but definitely not Edward Said. No, and for them to not produce it means that they're, they're not the right company to work with. I wouldn't want to work with them. And I think there are many great companies that you could go and find. So maybe that's an invitation to go and seek further. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for coming and speaking out and telling everybody your opinion. Um, but I had a question because um, what do you think made the difference for you to be enriched this, with this way of thinking, which a lot of other Muslim uh, youth don't have because you grew up with Islam, uh, the same as a lot of other Muslim youth. Why do you think uh, you were enriched with this way of thinking? And um, which is a, a lot, of, a bit different from what most Muslim countries live by. Well, uh, when I was born in Morocco uh, as a Moroccan citizen, I'm still a Moroccan citizen, I am considered by the law as a Muslim. 
Either I want it or no. In Morocco, there is only two official co religious communities. If you are not Jewish, you are Muslim. You are born, you marry, you inherit, you divorce, you are buried as a Muslim. Either you want it or no. And as a Muslim-born child in Morocco, you have to study Islam as a compulsory thing at school from the kindergarten to the end of high school, which I did. I learned Quran. I was even beaten at school when I didn't learn Quran. I learned how to pray. I prayed in the mosque, etc. So I can say that I grew up in Islam maybe more than most of those who grew in secular societies in Europe. But this is not the question. The question is, what is the choice of every individual? Stay in Islam, have stand far from it, criticize it, or just accept it uh, as uh, it is? Um, I think that uh, I did this uh, effort of understanding Islam, the Islamic religion. I, I, I studied Islam, the, I mean, a, a very long part of my life I spent it studying Islam. And even when it was not compulsory, when I went to France, uh, after university, after uh, high school, I, I, I did continue studying Islam and Islamology. Uh, if I was a man, and if I was a believer, I could be an imam, uh, actually. But a woman cannot be an imam in it. I don't know if I really want to do that anyway. But uh, so uh, these young people uh, who uh, you say here in Europe grew up in Islam, actually, uh, what, in what Islam did they grow? For me, they grew up in a country where they have rights, where they have the choice to believe in Islam or not to believe Islam. Sometimes people have to understand that they, they can seize certain rights. They can practice certain rights. Um, uh, of course, we all receive things from our parents, but we also have the choice to decide to reject it or to accept it. And I think that today everyone can open a book. Everyone can understand what Islam is about, and no one is obliged particularly in a European society, to say, I am obliged to be a Muslim because it is like that. And those who choose uh, to be a Muslim, who like to be a Muslim, who believe in Islam, who have the faith in Islam, they have definitely the right to do so. But uh, they cannot ask the society to consider this thing as, uh, as um, I mean, as something giving them different rights or different duties. They are just citizens as everyone. And my belief is that the personal belief or, of everyone must stay in their private life and not be imposed to the others. So um, I consider if someone who uh, was forced to become a Muslim could uh, make a different choice, so definitely everyone uh, can. I think there are many questions, but I think we're drawing to a close. Janta, maybe one or two more, but many people will be disappointed because they haven't asked our question, but that's how it is. <laughs> hey, that's Jair. Hey, Jair. Hello. Uh, thank you for being here and for sharing your views with us. I have a question for you because it's really interesting how you try to describe Islamophasism and dis uh, compare it with uh, fascism in history. I wonder uh, how, in your view, did it become a fascism? So, of course, it's a big question, but can you maybe elabor elaborate a little bit on that? So, how did it become a fascism? It became a fascism. Uh, I think it's, it's not a new phenomenon. It is a new phenom phenomenon in Europe, but it is a process. When you look uh, uh, behind, when you look in the history, in the 20th, in the 20s, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was born in Egypt. And even uh, in older times, uh, uh, through history, each time uh, you, you had attempts to enlighten Islam, you also had certain fundamentalists 
uh, Muslims who uh, who tried to uh, kill those attempts. Many uh, Muslim people cite uh, Ibn Rushd, who is known as uh, Averroes, uh, uh, as a free thing. They cite al hallaj as a big Sufi, but they forget to say that al hallaj was cru crucified and Ibn Rushd books was burned in the public place. So we always had this dichotomy in the uh, Islamic world in the past. People who are enlightened, who are free, who are trying to open this civilization on something else, and the official establishment, either the official Islamic state or um, Islamic uh, groups who are uh, trying to practice something more fundamentalist. Uh, so I cannot resume, I cannot answer this question in a very uh, a brief lapse of uh, time, but it's definitely an interesting question. It's not something that comes from yesterday. I think um, this was the last question. I'm terribly <laughs> sad about it because we're having so such in interesting conversations, and we have um, uh, uh, a short while um, uh, to we, we we can listen a little bit to uh, some more music and then uh, it's the end of the evening i like to really really maybe thank we can you. have drinks in the lobby yeah maybe yeah. we have drinks in the lobby and talks <laughs> in the lobby of course the, the third half but uh, i'd like to thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us and i'd like to uh, thank you both thank very you. very thank much you, for your music and your talk and your ideas and your freedom <laughs> I'm waiting. Ah, yeah. So, uh, Zinab, again, this one is for you. It's called Nur al Ain, the light in the eyes. You have the light in the eyes. And um, uh, Nur al Ain is Arabic for the, for the light in the eyes. Um, may we support children and may we support women uh, to be whoever they want to be. You can snap your hands. Yes, let's make it soulful. Nur al Hain, Nur al Hain. God bless the woman. Ya Nur al Hain, Nur al Hain. God bless the child. I carry myself with dignity I carry myself alone I carry you inside my heart Nur al 24-7 you were always there with me Ya yeah, Nur al I gotta beam the light Gotta change the game Cause my spirit is so alive I'm a queen who can fight any struggle with the mind I can be your revolution, I can be your president I can be a footballer, I can be whoever I wanna be Ya yeah, Nur al Ain, Nur al Ain God bless the woman Ya yeah, Nur al Ain, Nur al Ain God bless the child Baby, you are beautiful Sister, you're not alone So wear your crown, wear your crown And don't forget to smile To the world, the world around you Beam the light inside your eyes To the universe, universe us. God bless the child, oh, 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 24 7. You were always there with me, yeah, Nur al Ain. I gotta beam the light, gotta change the game, cause my spirit is so alive. You're a queen who can fight any struggle in your mind. You can be a revolution, you can be a president, you can be a footballer, you can be whoever you wanna be. 
say yeah, yo. For my sister, say yeah, yo. De Bali laat je even horen. Say yeah, yo. For my sister, say hey, oh. Say yeah, yo. Say yeah, yo. Say yeah, yo. Say yeah, yo. I think they can do better than this, sir. Eh? Yeah, yo. That's what you do. Say yeah, yo. Say yeah, yo. For my sister, say eh, oh. Say yeah, yo. For my sister, say eh, oh. Say yeah, yo. For my sister, say eh, oh, oh. Nur line, nur line. God bless the woman. Oh, nur line, nur line. God bless the child. Say nur line, nur line. God bless the woman. Nur line, nur line. God bless the child. Thank you. Thank you well. Actors Erdogan.